Carl Friedrich Abel, contemporary of Stern, German, who was not very good at English, but one of the things he did to enable him to communicate was he would play and he would improvise. And one of the pieces that he used to improvise to was a section of Lawrence Stern called The Story of Lefevre, which is a sad story about the death of a, a military man, an army man, in a local hostelry that Uncle Toby, that most generous of souls, is told is sickening and dying with his young son with him. And the story unfolds over a number of chapters, the story of Lefevre. And Abel would take that story. We don't know what he did with it. We don't know whether the story was read. We don't know whether the people just knew the story in the same way that if he did the death of Bambi, we'd know the death of Bambi because we'd have an idea in our heads. But Abel would take that piece and would interpret it in his own particular way. Another death, the death of the moth by Virginia Woolf. I'm delighted to be able to welcome Francis Spaulding, expert on Virginia Woolf, who will read that text to us after Richard has introduced us with a piece, an air of Friedrich Abel's. Well, I, th I thought I'd first read a, a section from an obituary of Abel, um, which describes just the situation. He said, which says, justly admired as he was for his public performances, it was a few only of his intimate friends in private who were witnesses of his most wonderful musical powers, to come at which a bottle of good burgundy before him and his vile de gamba within his reach were necessary. In that situation, his friends would introduce the subject of the human passions, and Abel, not very capable of expressing in English his own sentiments, would catch up his vial and tell the story of Lefevre thereon, till he brought tears to the eyes of his hearers and not lay it down till he had made his friend Gainsborough dance a hornpipe on the bottom of a pewter quart pot. <laughs> that fly by day are not properly to be called moths. They do not excite that pleasant sense of dark autumn nights and ivy blossom which the commonest yellow underwing asleep in the shadow of a curtain never fails to rouse in us. They are hybrid creatures, neither gay like butterflies nor sombre like their own species. Nevertheless, the present specimen, with his narrow, hay-coloured wings, fringed with a tassel of the same colour, seemed to be content with life. It was a pleasant morning, mid-September, mild, benignant, yet with a keener breath than that of the summer months. The plough was already scoring the field opposite the window, and where the share had been, the earth was pressed flat and gleamed with moisture. Such vigour came rolling in from the fields and the down beyond, that it was difficult to keep the eyes strictly turned upon the book. The rooks, too, were keeping one of their annual festivities, soaring round the treetops until it looked as if a vast net with thousands of black knots had, in it had been cast up into the air, which, after a few moments, sank slowly down upon the trees until every twig seemed to have a knot at the end of it. Then suddenly the net would be thrown into the air again, in a wider circle this time, with the utmost clamour and vociferation, as though to be thrown into the air and settle slowly down upon the tree tops were a tremendously exciting experience. The same energy which inspired the rooks, the ploughmen, the horses, and even, it seemed, the lean bareback downs, sent the moth, fluttering from one side of the square to the other of the window pane. One could not help watching him. One was indeed conscious of a queer feeling of pity for him. The possibilities of pleasure seemed that morning so enormous and so various that to have only a moth's part in life 
and a day moths at that, appeared a hard fate, and his zest in enjoying his meagre opportunities to the full, pathetic. He flew vigorously to one corner of his compartment, and after waiting there a second, flew across to the other. What remained for him but to fly to a third corner, and then to a fourth? That was all he could do. In spite of the size of the downs, the width of the sky, the far-off smoke of the houses, and the romantic voice now and then of a steamer out at sea. What he could do, he did. Watching him, it seemed as if a fibre, very thin but pure, of the enormous energy of the world, had been thrust into his frail and, and into his sorry into his frail and diminutive body. As often as he crossed the plain, I could fancy that a thread of vital light became visible. He was little or nothing but life. Yet because he was so small and so simple a form of the energy that was rolling in at the open window and driving its way through so many narrow and intricate corridors in my own brain and in those of other human beings, there was something marvellous as well as pathetic about him. It was as if someone had taken a tiny bead of pure life and decking it as lightly as possible with down and feathers, had set it dancing and zigzagging to show us the true nature of life. Thus displayed, one could not get over the strangeness of it. One is apt to forget about all about life, seeing it humped and bossed and garnished and cumbered so that it has to move with greater circumspection and dignity. Again, the thought of all that life might have been had he been born in another shape caused one to view his simple activities with a kind of pity. After a time, tired by his dancing apparently, he settled on the window ledge in the sun, and the queer spectacle being at an end, I forgot about him. Then looking up, my eye was caught by him. He was trying to resume his dancing, but seemed either so stiff or so awkward that he could only flutter to the bottom of the window pane, and when he tried to fly, up to fly across it, he failed. Being intent on other matters, I watched these futile attempts for a time without thinking, unconsciously waiting for him to resume his flight, as one waits for a machine that has stopped momentarily to start again without considering the reason of its failure. After perhaps a seventh attempt, he slipped from the wooden ledge and fell, fluttering his wings, onto his back on the window sill. The helplessness of his attitude roused me. It flashed upon me that he was in difficulties. He could no longer raise himself. His legs struggled vainly. But as I stretched out a pencil, meaning to help him to right himself, it came over me that the failure and awkwardness were the approach of death. I laid the pencil down again. The legs agitated themselves once more. I looked as if for the enemy against which he struggled. I looked out of doors. What had happened there? Presumably it was midday and work in the fields had stopped. Stillness and quiet had replaced the previous animation. The birds had taken themselves off to feed in the brooks. The horses stood still. Yet the power was there all the same, massed outside, indifferent, impersonal, not attending to anyone or anything in particular. Somehow it was opposed to the little hay-coloured moth. It was useless to try to do anything. One could only watch the extraordinary efforts made by those tiny legs against an oncoming doom which could, had it chosen, have submerged an entire city, not merely a city, but masses of human beings. Nothing, I knew, had any chance against death. Nevertheless, after a pause of exhaustion, the legs fluttered again. It was superb, this last protest, and so frantic that he succeeded at last in writing himself. One's sympathies, of course, were all on the side of life. Also, when there was nobody to care or to know, this gigantic effort on the part of an insignificant little moth 
against a power of such magnitude, to retain what no one else valued or desired to keep, moved one strangely. Again, somehow, one saw life, a pure bead. I lifted the pencil again, useless though I knew it to be. But even as I did so, the unmistakable tokens of death showed themselves. The body relaxed and instantly grew stiff. The struggle was over. The insignificant little creature now knew death. As I looked at the dead moth, this minute wayside triumph of so great a force over so mean an antagonist filled me with wonder. Just as life had been strange a few minutes before, so death was now as strange. The moth, having righted himself, now lay most decently and uncomplainingly composed. Oh yes, he seemed to say, death is stronger than I am. <laughs> Thank you.